Chapter 35 and 36 of Don Quixote, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Shep. Don Quixote, Volume 2, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapter 35. Wherein is continued the instruction given to Don Quixote touching the disenchantment of Dulcinea, together with other marvelous incidents. They saw advancing towards them, to the sound of the pleasing music, what they call a triumphal car, drawn by six gray mules with white linen housings, on each of which was mounted a penitent, robed also in white with large lighted wax taper in his hand. The car was twice or perhaps three times as large as the former ones, and in front and on the side stood twelve more penitents, all as white as snow and all with lighted tapers a spectacle to excite fear as well as wonder and on a raised throne was seated a nymph draped in a multitude of silver tissued veils with an embroidery of countless gold spangles glittering all over them that made her appear if not richly at least brilliantly apparelled she had her face covered with a thin transparent sandal the texture of which did not prevent the fair features of a maiden from being distinguished while the numerous lights made it possible to judge of her beauty and of her years, which seemed to be not less than seventeen, but to have not yet reached twenty. Beside her was a figure in a robe of state, as they call it, reaching to the feet, while the head was covered with a black veil. But the instant the car was opposite the Duke and Duchess and Don Quixote, the music of the clarion ceased, and then that of the lutes and harps on the car, and the figure in the robe rose up and flinging it apart and removing the veil from its face, disclosed to their eyes the shape of death itself, fleshless and hideous, at which sight Don Quixote felt uneasy. Sancho frightened, and the Duke and Duchess displayed a certain trepidation. Having risen to its feet, this living death, in a sleepy voice and with a tongue hardly awake, held forth as follows. I am that Merlin who the legends say the devil had for father, and the lie hath gathered credence in the lapse of time. O magic prince of Zerathic lore, monarch and treasurer with jealous eye, I view the efforts of the age to hide the gallant deeds of dowry errant knights, who are, and ever have been, dear to me. Enchanters and magicians and their kind are mostly hard of heart. Not so am I. For mine is tender, soft, compassionate, and its delight is doing good to all in the dim caverns of the gloomy depths, where tracing my mystic lines and characters my soul abideth now. There came to me the sorrow-laden plight of her the fair, the peerless Dulcinea del Tobaso. I knew of her enchantment and her fate from high-born dame to peasant wretch transformed and touched with pity first i turned the leaves of countless volumes of my devilish craft and then in the grim grisly skeleton myself encasing hither have i come to show where lies the fitting remedy to give relief in such a pious case o thou the pride and pink of all that wear the adamantine steel O shining light, O beacon, pole star, path and guide of all, whose scorning slumber and the lazy down adopt the toilsome life of blood-stained arms, to thee, great hero who all praise transcends, La Mancha's luster and Ibera's star, Don Quixote, wise and brave, to thee I say, for peerless Dulcinea del Tobaso, her pristine form and beauty to regain, tis needful that the squire Sancho shall, on his own sturdy buttocks bared to heaven, three thousand and three hundred lashes lay, and that they smart and sting and hurt him well. Thus have the authors of her woe resolved, and this is gentless wherefore i have come by all that's good exclaimed sancho to this 
I'll just as soon give myself three stabs with a dagger as three, not to say three thousand lashes. The devil takes such a way of disenchanting. I, I don't see what my backside has got to do with enchantments. By God, if Signor Merlin has not found out some other way of disenchanting the Lady Dulcinea del Tobaso, she may go to her grave enchanted. But I'll take you, Don Clown, stuffed with garlics, said Don Quixote, and tie you to a tree as naked as when your mother brought you forth, and give you not to say three thousand three hundred, but six thousand six hundred lashes, and so well laid on that they won't be got rid of if you try three thousand three hundred times. Don't answer me a word, or I'll tear your soul out. On hearing this, Merlin said, that will not do, for the lashes worthy Sancho has to receive must be given of his own free will, and not by force, at whatever time he pleases, for there is no fixed limit assigned to him, but it is permitted him, if he likes to commute by half the pain of this whipping, to let them be given by the hand of another, though it may be somewhat weighty. Not a hand, my own, or anybody else's, weighty or weight a bull, shall touch me, said Sancho. Was it I that gave birth to the lady Dulcinea del Tobaso, that my backside is to pay for the sins of her eyes? My master, indeed, that's a part of her, for he's always calling her my life and my soul, and his stay and prop, may and ought to whip himself for her, and take all the trouble required for her disenchantment. But for me to whip myself? Abenerco! As soon as Sancho had done speaking, the nymph in silver that was at the side of Merlin's ghost stood up, and removing the thin veil from her face, disclosed one that seemed to all something more than exceedingly beautiful. And with a masculine freedom from embarrassment, and in that voice not very like a lady's, addressing Sancho directly, said, Thou wretched squire, soul of a pitcher, heart of a cork tree, and bowels of flint and pebbles, if, thou impudent thief, they bade thee throw thyself down from some lofty tower, if enemy of mankind, if they asked thee to swallow a dozen toads, two lizards, and three adders, if they wanted thee to slay thy wife and children with a sharp murderous scimitar, it would be no wonder for thee to show thyself stubborn and squeamish. But to make peace of work about three thousand three hundred lashes? What every poor little charity boy gets every month? It is enough to amaze, astonish, and astound the compassionate bowels of all who hear it. Nay, all who come to hear it in the course of time. Turn, O oh miserable, hard-hearted animal, turn, I say, those timorous owl's eyes upon these of mine that are compared to radiant stars. O oh, thou wilt see them weeping, trickling streams and rills, and tracing furrows, tracks, and paths over the fair fields of my cheeks. Let it move thee crafty, ill-conditioned monster, to see my blooming youth still in its teens, for I am not yet twenty, wasting and withering away beneath the husk of a rude peasant wretch. And if I do not appear in that shape now, it is a special favor Signor Merlin here has granted me, to the sole end that my beauty may soften thee. For the tears of beauty and distress turn rocks into cotton, and tigers into ewes. Lay on to that hide of thine, thou great untamed brute. Rouse up thy lusty vigor that only urges thee to eat and eat and set free the softness of my flesh, the gentleness of my nature, and the fairness of my face. And if thou wilt not relent or come to reason for me, do so for the sake of that poor knight thou hast beside thee, thy master, I mean, whose soul I can this moment see, how he has it stuck in his throat, not ten fingers from his lips, and only waiting for thy inflexible or yielding reply to make its escape by his mouth or go back again into his stomach. Don Quixote, on hearing this, felt his throat, and turning to the duke, he said, by God, Signor, Dulcinea says true, I have my soul stuck here in my throat like the nut of a crossbow. What say you to this, Sancho? said the Duchess. I say, Signora, returned Sancho, what I said before, as for the lashes, Abenerco! Abenerco, you should say, Sancho, and not as you do, said the Duke. Let me alone, Your Highness said Sancho. I am not in a humor now to look into niceties or letter more or less, 
for these lashes that are to be given me, or I am to give myself, have so upset me that I don't know what I am saying or doing, but I'd like to know of this lady, my lady Dulcinea del Tobaso. Where she learned this way she has for asking favors, she comes to ask me to score my flesh with lashes, and she calls me soul of a pitcher, and great untamed brute, and sting of foul names that the devil is welcome to? Is my flesh brass, or is it anything to me whether she is enchanted or not? Does she bring with her a basket of fair linen, shirts, kerchiefs, socks, not that wear any, to coax me? No, nothing but one piece of abuse after another, though she knows the proverb they have here, that an ass loaded with gold goes lightly up a mountain, and that gifts break rocks, and praying to God, and plying the hammer, and that one take is better than two, I'll give these." Then there's my master, who ought to stroke me down and pet me to make me turn wool and carded cotton. He says if he gets hold of me, he'll tie me naked to a tree and double the tail of lashes on me. These tender-hearted gentry should consider that it's not merely a squire, but a governor they are asking to whip himself, just as if it was drink with cherries. Let them learn, plague take them the right way to ask and beg and behave themselves, for all times are not alike, nor are people always in good humor. I am now ready to burst with grief at seeing my green coat torn, and they come to me to whip myself of my own free will, I having as little fancy for it as a turning kachik. Well then, the fact is, friend Sancho, said the duke, that unless you become softer than a ripe fig, you shall not get a hold of the government. It would be a nice thing for me to send my islanders a cruel governor with flinty bowels, who won't yield to the tears of afflicted damsels, or to the prayers of wise, magisterical, ancient enchanters and sages. In short, Sancho, either you must be whipped by yourself, or they must whip you, or you shan't be governor." Signor, said Sancho, won't two days' grace be given me in which to consider what is best for me? No! Certainly not, said Merlin. Here, this minute and on the spot, the matter must be settled. Either Dulcinea will return to the cave of Montesinos and to her former condition of peasant wretch, or else in her present form shall be carried to the Elysian fields, where she will remain, waiting until the number of stripes is completed. Now then, Sancho, said the Duchess, show courage and gratitude for your master Don Quixote's bread that you have eaten. We are all bound to oblige and please him for his benevolent disposition and lofty chivalry. Consent to this whipping, my son, to the devil, with the devil, and leave fear to millsopes. For a stout heart breaks bad luck, as you very well know. To this Sancho replied with an irrelevant mark, which, addressing Merlin, he made to him, Will your worship tell me, Signor Merlin, when that courier devil came up, he gave my master a message from Signor Montesinos, charging him to wait for him here, as he was coming to arrange how the lady Donna Dulcinea del Tobaso was to be disenchanted, but up to the present, we have not seen Montesinos, nor anything like him. To which Merlin made answer, The devil, Sancho, is a blockhead and a great scoundrel. I sent him to look for your master, but not with a message from Montesinos, but from myself. For Montesinos is in his cave expecting, or more properly speaking, waiting for his disenchantment. For there's the tale to be skinned yet for him. If he owes you anything, or if you have any business to transact with him, I'll bring him to you and put him where you choose. But for the present make up your mind to consent to the penance, for believe me, it will be very good for you, for soul as well as for body, for your soul because of the charity with which you perform it, for your body because I know that you are of sanguine habit, and it will do you no harm to draw a little blood. 
There are a great many doctors in this world. Even the enchanters are doctors, said Sancho. However, as everyone tells me the same thing, though I can't see it myself, I say I am willing to give myself the three thousand three hundred lashes, provided I am to lay them on whenever I like, without any fixing of days or times. And I'll try to get out of debt as quickly as I can, that the world may enjoy the beauty of the Lady Dulcinea del Tobaso. As it seems contrary to what I thought, that she is beautiful after all. It must be a condition, too, that I am not to be bound to draw blood with the scourge, and that if any of the lashes happen to be fly-flappers, they are to count. Item, that, in this case, I should make any mistake in the reckoning, Signor Merlin, as he knows everything, is to keep count and let me know how many are still wanting, or over the number. There will be no need to let you know of any over said Merlin, because when you reach the full number, the Lady Dulcinea will at once, and that very instant, be disenchanted, and will come in her gratitude to seek out the worthy Sancho, and thank him, and even reward him for the good work. So you have no cause to be uneasy about stripes too many or too few. Heaven forbid I should cheat anyone of even a hair of his head." Well, then, in God's hands be it, said Sancho. In the hard case I am in, I give in. I say I accept the penance on the conditions laid down. The instant Sancho uttered these last words, the music of the clarion struck up once more, and again a host of muskets were discharged, and Don Quixote hung on Sancho's neck, kissing him again and again on the forehead and cheeks. The Duchess and the Duke expressed their greatest satisfaction. The car began to move on, and as it passed, the fair Dulcinea bowed to the Duke and Duchess, and made a low curtsy to Sancho. And now the bright, smiling dawn came upon a pace. The flowers of the field revived, raised up their heads, and the crystal waters of the brooks murmuring over the gray and white pebbles hastened to pay their tribute to the expectant rivers. The glad earth, the unclouded sky, the fresh breeze, the clear light, each and all showed that the day had come treading on the skirts of morning, would be calm and bright. The Duke and Duchess, pleased with their hunt and having carried out their plan so cleverly and successfully, returned to their castle resolved to follow up their joke, for to them there was no reality that could afford them more amusement. Chapter 36 Wherein is related the strange and undreamt-of adventure of the distressed duenna, alias the Countess of Trafaldi, together with the letter which Sancho Panza wrote to his wife, Teresa Panza. The duke had a major-domo of a very factious and supportive turn, and he, it was, that played the part of Merlin, made all the arrangements for the late adventure, composed the verses, and got a page to represent Dulcinea. And now, with the assistance of his master and mistress, he got up another of the drollest and strangest contrivances that can be imagined. The Duchess asked Sancho the next day if he had made a beginning with his penance task, which he had to perform for the disenchantment of Dulcinea, he said he had, and had given himself five lashes overnight. The Duchess asked him what he had given them with. He said, with his hand. That, said the Duchess, is more like giving oneself slaps than lashes. I am sure the sage Merlin will not be satisfied with such tenderness. Worthy Sancho must make a scourge with claws or a cat -a nine tails that will make itself felt, for it's with blood that letters enter and the release of so great a lady as Dulcinea will not be granted so cheaply or at such a paltry price. And remember, Sancho, that works of charity done in a lukewarm and half-hearted way are without merit and of no avail. To which Sancho replied, If your ladyship will give me a proper scourge or cord, I'll lay on with it, provided it does not hurt too much. For you must know, boar as I am, my flesh is more cotton than hemp, and it won't do for me to destroy myself for the good of anybody else. So be it, by all means, said the Duchess. Tomorrow I'll give you a scourge that will be just the thing for you, and will accommodate itself to the tenderness of your flesh, as if it were its own sister. 
then said sancho your highness must know dear lady of my soul that i have a letter written to my wife teresa panza giving her an account of all that has happened to me since i left her i have it here in my bosom and there's nothing wanting but to put the address to it i'll be glad if your discretion would read it for i think it runs in the governor's style i mean the way governors ought to write and who dictated it said the duchess that i didn't said sancho for i can neither read nor write though i can sign my name let us see it said the duchess for never fear but you display it in the quality and quantity of your wit sancho drew out an open letter from his bosom and the duchess taking it found it ran in this fashion Sancho Panza's letter to his wife, Teresa Panza. If I was well whipped, I went mounted like a gentleman. If I have got a good government, it is at the cost of a good whipping. Thou wilt not understand this just now, my Teresa. By and by thou wilt know what it means. I may tell thee, Teresa, I mean thee to go in a coach, for that is a matter of importance, because every other way of going is going on all fours. Thou art a governor's wife. Take care that nobody speaks evil of thee behind thy back. I send thee here a green hunting suit that my lady the duchess gave me. Alter it so as to make a petticoat and bodice for our daughter. Don Quixote, my master, if I am to believe what I hear in these parts, is a madman of some sense and a droll blockhead, and I am no way behind him. We have been in the cave of Montesinos and the sage Merlin has laid hold of me for the disenchantment of Dulcinea del Tobaso, her that is called Aldonza Lorenzo over there, with three thousand three hundred lashes, less five that I am to give myself, she will be left as entirely disenchanted as the mother that bore her. Say nothing of this to anyone, for make thy affairs public, and some will say they are white, and others will say they are black. I shall leave this in a few days for my government, to which I am going with a mighty desire to make money, for they tell me all new governors set out with the same desire. I will feel the pulse of it, and will let thee know if thou art to come and live with me or not. Dapple is well, and sends many remembrances to thee. I am not going to leave him behind, though they took me away to be Grand Turk. My lady the Duchess kisses thy hands a thousand times. Do thou make a return with two thousand? For as my master says, nothing costs less, or is cheaper than civility. God has not been pleased to provide another valise for me with another hundred crowns, like the one the other day, but never mind, my Teresa. The bell-ringer is in safe quarters, and all will come out in the scouring of the government. Only it troubles me greatly what they tell me, that once I have tasted it, I will eat my hands off after it, and if that is so, it will not come very cheap to me though to be sure the maimed have a benefice of their own in the alms they beg for, so that one way or another thou wilt be rich in luck. God give it to thee, as he can, and keep me to serve thee, from this castle the 20th of July, 1614. Thy husband the governor, Sancho Panza. When she had done reading the letter, the duchess said to Sancho, on two points the worthy governor goes rather astray. One is in saying, or hinting, that this government has been bestowed upon him for the lashes that he is to give himself, when he knows, and he cannot deny it, that when my lord the duke promised it to him, nobody ever dreamt of such a thing as lashes. The other is that he shows himself here to be very covetous, and I would not have him a money-seeker, for covetous bursts the bag, and the covetous governor does ungoverned justice. I don't mean it that way, Signora," said Sancho. And if you think the letter doesn't run as it ought to do, it's only to tear it up and make another. And maybe it will be a worse one if it is left to my gumption. No, no, said the Duchess. This one will do, and I wish the Duke to see it. With this, they bestook themselves to the garden where they were to dine, and the Duchess showed Sancho's letter to the Duke, who was highly delighted with it. They dined, and after the cloth had been removed, and they had assumed themselves for a while, within Sancho's rich conversation, the melancholy sound of a fife and harsh discordant drum made itself heard. All seemed somewhat put out by this dull, confused, martial harmony, especially Don Quixote, who could not keep his seat from pure disquietude. 
As to Sancho, it is needless to say that fear drove him to his usual refuge, the side or the skirts of the Duchess, and indeed, and in truth, the sound they heard was a most soulful and melancholy one. While they were still in uncertainty, they saw advancing towards them through the garden two men clad in mourning robes, so long and flowing that they trailed upon the ground. As they marched, they beat two great drums, which were likewise draped in black, and beside them came the fife-player, black and somber like the others. Following these came a personage of gigantic stature, enveloped rather than clad in gown and the deepest black, the skirt of which was of prodigious dimensions. Over the gown girdled or crossing his figure, he had a broad baldric which was so black, and from which hung a huge scimitar with a black scabbard and furniture. He had his face covered with a transparent black veil, through which might be descried a very long beard as white as snow. He came on keeping step to the sound of the drums with great gravity and dignity, and, in short, his stature, his gait, the somberness of his appearance, and his following might well have struck with astonishment, as they did all who beheld him without knowing who he was. With his measured pace and in his guise, he advanced to kneel before the duke, who, with the others, awaited him standing. The duke, however, would not on any account allow him to speak until he had risen. The prodigious scarecrow obeyed, and, standing up, removed the veil from his face and disclosed the most enormous, the longest, the whitest, and the thickest beard that human eyes had ever beheld until that moment. And then fetching up a grave, sonorous voice from the depths of this broad, capacious chest, and fixing his eyes on the duke, he said, Most high and mighty signor, my name is Trafaldin of the White Beard. I am squire to the Countess Trafaldi, otherwise called the Distressed Duena, on whose behalf I bear a message to your highness, which is that your magnificence will be pleased to grant her leave and permission to come and tell you her trouble, which is one of the strangest and most wonderful that the mind most familiar with trouble in the world could have imagined. But first she desires to know if the valiant and never vanquished knight Don Quixote of La Mancha is in your castle, for she has come in quest of him, on foot and without breaking her fast from the kingdom of Candy, to your realms here, a thing which may and ought to be regarded as a miracle, or set down to enchantment. She is even now at the gate of this fortress, or palaisance, and only waits for your permission to enter. I have spoken. And with that he coughed and stroked down his beard with both his hands, and stood very tranquilly waiting for the response of the duke, which was to this effect. Many days ago, worthy Squire Trafalden, of the white beard, we heard of the misfortune of my lady the Countess Trafaldi whom the enchanters have caused to be called the distressed duena. Bid her enter, O stupia squire, and tell her that the valiant knight Don Quixote of La Mancha is here, and from his generous disposition she may safely promise herself every protection and assistance, and you may tell her, too, that if my aid be necessary, it will not be withheld, for I am bound to give it to her by my quality of knight, which involves the protection of women of all sorts, especially widowed, wronged and distressed dames, such as her ladyship seems to be. On hearing this, Trafaldin bent the knee to the ground, and, making the sign to the fifer and drummers to strike up, he turned and marched out of the garden to the same notes and at the same pace as when he entered, leaving them all amazed at his bearing and solemnity. Turning to Don Quixote, the duke said, After all, renowned knight, the mists of malice and ignorance are unable to hide or obscure the light of value and virtue. I say so, because your excellence has been barely six days in this castle, and already the unhappy and the afflicted come in quest of you from lands far distant and remote, and not in coaches or dromedaries, but on foot and fasting, confident that in the mighty arm they will find a cure for their sorrows and troubles, thanks to your great achievements which are circulated all over the known earth. I wish, Senor Duke, replied Don Quixote, that blessed Elastasic, who at table the other day showed such ill will and bitter spite against knights errant, were here now to see with his own eyes whether knights of the sort are needed in the world, 
he would at any rate learn by experience that those suffering any extraordinary affliction or sorrow in extreme cases and unusual misfortunes do not go to look for a remedy to the houses of jurists or village sacraments or to the knight who has never attempted to pass the bounds of his own town or to the indolent courier who only seeks for news to repeat and talk of instead of striving to do deeds and exploits for others to relate and record relief in distress help in need protection for damsels consolidation for widows are to be found in no sort of persons better than i knights errant and i give unceasing thanks to heaven that i am one and regard any misfortune or suffering that may befall me in the pursuit of so honourable a calling as endured to good purpose let this duenna come and ask what she will for i will effect her relief by the might of my arm and the dauntless resolution of my bold heart End of chapter thirty five and thirty six recorded by David Shep in Los Angeles.